Welcome to a new episode of The Untold with Havi Buzo. Today we will be talking about one of the most major problems the Middle East continues to face today, anti-Semitism, radicalization, and hate speech, which have been the main cause of decades of deadly violence. But are things changing? And what could we and should we be doing to confront this major problem that has affected the Middle East region and the world as we know it? With us to talk about this is David Weinberg, who is the Anti-Defamation League's Washington representative for international affairs, where he serves as the organization's primary point of contact on foreign policy issues. He is also ADL's lead analyst on the Arab Gulf related issues. Thank you so much for joining me today, David. Thanks for having me, David. ADL has done tremendous work on confronting anti-Semitism and hate in general, And you, David, have been focusing on the Middle East, where this problem is on a very large scale. Anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, hate speech, anti-minority, and the anti-Israel rhetoric is very widespread and is systematic. People like me who grew up in this region would argue that this campaign of disinformation by the governments and the regimes, and obviously the propaganda that has brought a lot of destruction to this region for decades now. You've done a lot of work, and we're going to start with a study that you've done recently on anti-Semitism in uh, the school textbooks Mm -hmm. in Iran. So the Iranian regime, I mean, as everybody knows, is fundamentally just uh, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, anti-American, anti-West, anti-democracies, I mean, anti a lot of things uh, that people like us, we believe in, who are very fortunate to live in a democracy. But tell us about your findings from this study that you have done on textbooks in Iran. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, The the curricula in the Middle East um, follow a, a somewhat different um, model, just generally speaking, uh, than, than they do in the United States, where education is very um, decentralized um, and um, very different depending on what locality you live in. Um, in the Middle East, the, the norm is uh, for most uh, countries to write and publish their own textbooks. So every year when a new publish, when a new edition of a textbook is issued for say, you know, chemistry or math or or religious studies, it'll often be written and published um, through the government. And so for that reason, there's um, textbooks play a a somewhat greater role in terms of uh, being a a vehicle for historical narratives and identity, as well as um, ideological propagation. And, um, and th- we see this, uh, of course, with regard to conspiracy theories or um, misinformation or anti-Semitism, which of course are not Middle East specific phenomena. Those are, are things inherent to the you know, tolerance and intolerance are things inherent to the human condition and something that, you know, people struggle with in different ways in every age. So um, in Iran in particular, um, there had been no study published in a comprehensive manner about hate and extremism and violence in the Iranian curriculum um, in the last uh, half year. Um, Certainly not um, uh, at extended length and um, with wide media distribution in English. Um, and you know, in a sense, it, it's perhaps not surprising to find hate in Iran's government textbooks, right? If I bet you, you know, is, the, how, is there hate in these textbooks? And if so, how much? And you bet, you know, nine or 10, and it was nine or 10, you probably wouldn't be surprised. Um, but the ways in which it manifests um, is sometimes instructive, right? Um, the ways in which they change over time can be interesting and, and also um, just simply verifying the severity and, and ongoing nature of it, I think are all important for sort of informing the public discourse um, as well as, as policymakers. So that's sort of where the study fits in and, and uh, happy to get into any of the specifics of our findings um, if that would be helpful. 
Yes, I mean, I kind of wanted to know a little bit more about what is this regime trying to teach yeah. children in this country? The hate, anti-Semitism, all of those, like, it's a campaign, basically, yeah. by this regime. And this has been ongoing for decades, but mm -hmm. it's really important when it comes to children, just because they're defenseless, they're just kind of on the receiving end of information. So what were your findings, David? So um, the, the Iranian government um, the regime that's been in place for, for over four decades is really dedicated to a historical world narrative of global revolution um, in some key ways. Uh, that um, history is, is, in the view of, of the state, um, uh, a matter of um, good versus evil throughout human history. And that a lot of that in the modern period is in the form of imperialism uh, and that um, true Islam with Iran as the, the vanguard um, is playing a crucial role in defending Islam from being destroyed by its enemies and that at the head of that, um, of those enemies and world imperialism is the United States and that in the region in the Middle East in particular the, the spearhead of that effort is the state of Israel um, and that the broader context are um, states throughout the Arab world um, that are portrayed as puppets of imperialism. So that's sort of the, the worldview that the Iranian state teaches through these textbooks. Um, and we see it manifested with particular claims or misinformation or hate or calls to um, supporting terrorism um, in different aspects of the curriculum. So for example, um, throughout history, um, especially from the, um, the start of the Prophet Muhammad's um, holy message um, to present day, um, Jews are, are presented almost entirely um, in the role of a villain. Um, so not just since the creation of Theodore Herzl's modern iteration of Zionism as a self-determination movement for Jewish people um, akin to other nationalisms, um, but um, really sort of depicting an opposition with Jewry and Judaism going back to earliest times um, with you know, very rare limited exceptions such as the small remaining um, oppressed community of Jews in Iran today and the, the small minority of Jews elsewhere who explicitly disavow and oppose Zionism, which is a very small minority. Um, so that's sort of with regard to Jews, the books say teach death to Israel. Um, they say Israel must be destroyed. They say the, they call for the overthrow of the monarchy in Bahrain, um, as well as revolutions to um, overthrow or change governments uh, across most of the Middle East. Um, in, in line with the, um, this was, a, I think, a really striking um, framing. It says, in line with the, um, quote, the, the school of, of Qasem Soleimani. So not just saying we don't like this government or that policy of any given country, but rather we want to remake the region in line with the radical worldview of the IRGC's Quds Force um, in a way that, um, that isn't just a matter of particular policy, but is more of a sort of a radical worldview. Exactly. And I mean, as somebody who grew up under a regime similar to the Iranian regime, it is an ally of the Iranian regime, which is the Assad regime. It's, it's very similar in that way. Yeah, um, basically, yes, go ahead. Right. I, I imagine the emphasis on colonialism, especially in the Syrian curriculum, too, right? Exactly. Uh, so it, it's definitely a systematic campaign of disinformation, of propaganda, but it's based on hate mm -hmm. and based on uh, basically, while they are the ones who are perpetrating all of the killing against their own people, I mean, in the Iranian regime's case and in the Assad regime's case, it's also the surrounding countries and they're attacking Israel, but they're blaming Israel for all of what they've been doing to their own people. And of course, anti-Semitism is a major part of that campaign that they do. Yeah. But, you know, it's also interesting, and I think it's important for our audience to, to understand is that these regimes also 
um, have a campaign of hate against other minorities, mm -hmm. uh, against the LGBT community in Iran. So I want you to tell me a little bit more about that aspect of the Iranian regime's propaganda that yeah. is spreading to its people systematically. Sure. So intolerance in textbooks, it's, it's very rarely a concern that affects just one group, right? Um, the stability of, of pluralistic societies and participatory government require the rule of law and the protection of all. And so when we see misinformation and hate directed at one group, it often goes with misinformation and hate against other groups. So for example, the um, actually the Saudi curriculum, interestingly enough, for years had been calling for um, the death penalty for um, homosexuality. Um, particularly for men having sex with men. Um, and that has actually been removed from the Saudi curriculum as of this year for the first time in I don't know how long, um, which is mm -hmm. quite striking. Um, I actually was surprised I did not find similar content in the Iranian curriculum this year, but it may be I didn't know where to look. Um, I, I surveyed a very large number of textbooks, but I, I haven't read all of them. Um, What's very clear is that the Iranian curriculum does incite against many other groups, including Saudi Salafis, including against Buddhists, including against Baha'is, including against um, uh, Arab states in some ways, including against the US and Europe, um, including against um, Christian um, uh, missionaries um, <laughs> that the Iranian state incites um, hatred and perpetrates you know, murder and other horrible abuses against LGBT people. So mm -hmm. for example, there was a very striking United Nations um, report um, from the UN Rapporteur on Iran issues, um, which actually was reported on um, by um, Benny Weinthal and the, the Jerusalem Post quite recently, um, who highlighted this element of the, the United Nations report saying, there, the United Nations continues to receive worrisome reports that the Iranian government um, is complicit in um, electric shocks against gay youth. Um, wow. it, was, it was framed in a very broad general way without, in the UN report without citing spe a specific case or a specific place or, or more details than that. Um, but that sort of along with, you know, state hangings of, of gay people, for example, in Iran is, um, you know, something that's not just incidental, it's something that's reflective of state directed propaganda and um, judicial policy. Very disturbing to hear. It's just really yeah. um, heartbreaking too. Um, yeah. But you also talked about uh, the fact that you wrote some monograms about anti-Semitism in Saudi Arabia in the textbooks and the changes that have been made. Can you tell us a little bit more about that part of this issue? Absolutely. And it's one that I feel very um, deeply about. It's, something, it's the first sort of textbooks issue that I started studying professionally ever um, and have been really tracking year on year for um, maybe seven or eight years more intensively. Um, the, the Saudi curriculum is really important for a couple of reasons, um, right? I mean, it's, it's the, uh, I believe it's the only Arab state in the G20, uh, but also it's the, um, the home to the two holiest sites in Islam, right? Um, it's a government with um, substantial um, financial resources that it's used over decades to um, promote its, um, religious creed around the world um, with positive and negative consequences in different regards. Um, and it's, um, it's also a place where um, what they publish often gets picked up elsewhere. So for that reason, um, the, there was a lot of scrutiny after 9-11 of, of the Saudi state curriculum, uh, given the large number of Saudi nationals among the hijackers. Um, uh, and the, unfortunately, you know, as of two, two or three years ago, when, when I published a long report on the Saudi, the current then Saudi curriculum um, in Saudi textbooks for, I think it was the 2018-19 school year, 
every single group that was um, demonized or um, slandered against in Saudi state textbooks at that time, or, uh, or at the time of 9-11 were still demonized in the, in the textbooks as of 2018, 2019. Um, so, so it was a problem that had been longstanding. Um, I was one of several congressional witnesses for hearing about this in the House of Representatives in 2017. And we were asked to, um, if we had to give a grade to Saudi textbook reforms to date, what grade would we give? And, and it, the other speakers, if I remember, it was something like C or B. And I said F, uh, because even though there were changes in the books through 2017, 2018, they were not changes such that the incitement to hatred and violence was removed. It might be you know, reduced in some places or reframed, but mostly it was a matter of adding in other content, not about taking out the core problems. Mm -hmm. um, now that's actually changed in some ways, in some regards, not fully, um, in the last two years. So last, last school year, there were some, there were some positive changes. Um, most strikingly, there was the removal of the most anti-Christian um, chapter in the Saudi curriculum um, that sort of framed things as uh, Christianity as a, an invalid perverted religion engaging in global um, evangelization to destroy other faiths and to spread um, imperialism, um, which, by the way, is still taught me in the Iranian curriculum. Um, but that was removed. Until today. So yeah. that continues in Iran. Mm -hmm. But Saudi Arabia removed it last year from its books. Mm -hmm. um, this year, Saudi Arabia made several other significant removals. Um, they removed the most anti Semitic and anti Israel um, chapter in its curriculum. Um, they also um, removed the section on, um, uh, on most death penalty punishments under, um, under Saudi Salafist religious law. So while it may still be taught um, in um, sermons, for example, um, while some of it may still be on the books in Saudi law, though not always, not as frequently enforced as previously. Um, the books no longer call for executing gay people. They no longer call for executing uh, people who engage in adultery. They no longer call for executing perceived uh, sorcerers or um, uh, there was one other notable category in there. I believe they've removed the teaching about death penalty for apostasy, like mocking Islam or converting away from Islam. I'm not, but I think that's been removed as well. So now there are still problematic things in the curriculum, um, but it's, I would say that they've removed the most hateful, most of the most hateful content and that they've also removed the content that is most prone to violence, mm -hmm. to encouraging violence. Um, it's still, in some ways, an unacceptable curriculum. Um, but it's changes that I, you know, if you asked me a year ago, would this happen by now? Well, there are a lot of things if you asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have expected they'd be the way they are right now. That's, <laughs> that's a whole other story, right? But the, it's, yes. <laughs> the Saudi curriculum did make some really positive changes, and I really hope they don't stop where they are now. And definitely we will talk towards the end about what needs to be done because, I mean, removing probably is not enough, right? There may be, there should be some changes to reflect the reality of the history of the region. Yeah. Uh, also yeah. to educate people towards love and peace and um, a lot of things that could be, I mean, it should be reflected right. in textbooks for children, right? And there, and there are some good, good trends like that around the region. Um, so for example, the Saudi curriculum made an interesting shift um, in the last year in, in that regard, in, in one particular case, which was the way that the curriculum talks about the, um, the seventh century battle over Medina, al mm -hmm. um, the way they talk about it, the most common way that a lot of curricula in the region talk about it, um, and you can see it very starkly in Iranian curriculum still, 
Um, you can see it in the way the Saudi curriculum used to talk about it. In some ways they still do, but not as much. Um, you can see it in textbooks used by Hezbollah. Uh, is the Hebrew, uh, Hezbollah. Uh, yeah, both work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the private schools in Lebanon that are aligned with Hezbollah use this narrative too, that, mm -hmm. that sort of use the, 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 um, the episode of the battle over Medina in the seventh century to, as a story, as an allegory to teach um, that Jewish people are evil. Saying that because there were Jewish tribes that first were allied with the prophet Muhammad and then allied against him and fought him, um, this, it, it therefore should be a lesson to conclude that Jewish people in general are evil and break treaties and opposed to Islam, um, which is a deeply harmful teaching and not accurate. Not accurate, exactly. I mean, that's yeah. that's the other aspect. Yeah. So the um, the the welcome thing is that there are new ways of uh, there are other ways of approaching this historical and religious um, lesson that are both accurate and more um, appropriate. Mm -hmm. So um, the Saudi curriculum now has a has a lesson on, and actually the Egyptian curriculum, as of a year ago when I saw it too, have added lessons about the importance of the lesson of tolerance from the um, from the the struggle over Medina in the seventh century, and in particularly talking about the Prophet Muhammad's charter of Medina, um, the the pact that he made with all faith groups, including the Jewish minority in the city at the time and around it. Um, that Muslims and non-Muslims both have both rights and duties in, in, a, uh, in a proper Islamic um, polity. And so um, it can be a model of legitimizing, rightfully so, coexistence and cooperation between Muslims and Jews, and that the, the lesson from it needn't be about those groups that, including the Jewish ones, that broke the pact but rather about the lessons we can draw from that sort of collaboration that the prophet himself pursued in our present day. Um, another really positive example I'll touch on more briefly is in Morocco. Um, the Moroccan um, state curriculum recently added um, some pages talking about the, um, his the history of the Moroccan Jewish community mm -hmm. and that the um, about Moroccan Jewish heritage being part of the broader tapestry of Moroccan heritage mm -hmm. in, a, in, a con you know, in the context of a, of a state with Islamic traditions and Islamic leadership in terms of its principles and um, orientations that there still was a, a belonging role for Jewish people in history and today. And so that's, I think, a really great example of how it can be both localized to be it you know history within Saudi Arabia or history within Morocco, but also universal lessons to that are applicable and actually helpful to students and societies today. Absolutely, this is a very positive thing to see that there are positive changes. Yeah. It's very promising for the region that yeah. desperately needs it. But I cannot talk about this major issue of uh, anti-Semitism, radicalization in the region without talking about Qatar's role. Mm -hmm. um, this is a country that is uh, small, mm -hmm. very rich, and has designated a lot of its fortune to spread mm -hmm. anti-Semitism, anti-Israel, radicalization, hate, I mean, you name it. And it's very unfortunate for the region. It's very unfortunate for the rest of the world because that's been harmful all over. But the textbooks in Qatar, that's something I would be interested to know about. Mm -hmm. What are their textbooks? What do they look like for yeah. the children there? So I'd love to really engage in both parts of, of what you raised because I think they're really important. Um, I think I, I totally agree that Qatar has spent a lot of its um, wealth on spreading um, media messages across the region and around the world. Um, and regardless, and without being able necessarily for me to, to assess what's in the heart of, of, a, of a ruler, right? 
whether it was intent or not, I certainly think a major consequence of how those funds have been spent has been the spread of intolerance and conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism, without a doubt. Um, and this is something that um, needn't be inherent to cuttery policy or these media outlets, but I, I think unfortunately has been the case to date in most regards. Now, at the same time, you'll also see Qatar host things like interfaith dialogue summits with Jewish people and um, summits on Muslim Jewish or, or Muslim or uh, Islamic, uh, on helping the West relate and dialogue with the Islamic world. And things like that are not necessarily bad. And in fact, they're quite constructive. I just wish that they were the rule, not, not necessarily perhaps an exception in some regards. So. Um, I think a lot of it com comes down to um, uh, a broader ideological orientation, um, which is not necessarily that Qatar is a Muslim Brotherhood state, but that its leadership and its policy has been very closely aligned with Brotherhood and with Muslim Brotherhood ideology and networks. And, mess and news messages across the region. And, um, and that associatedly, um, uh, Yusuf al-Qaradawi, a prominent Muslim Brotherhood um, aligned um, intellectual figure has, has been a very influential close partner of the Qatari royal family's central leadership. Um, and, and, Relatedly, Karadawi's preacher organization, the International Union for Muslim Scholars, um, that now is he's passed on to his successors, but still sort of propagates a similar message. So you can see the sort of hate. I mean, really, you can see it sometimes in in Al Jazeera. Like, I could give you a hundred examples if you gave me a day. Um, yep. But you also see it even more starkly in some of the the networks that are aligned with Qatar and aligned with Turkey um, with the Brotherhood throughout the region. Um, and so, for example, like um, there's a, I think it's an online TV station, Al Qanat 9, uh, Al Tasa'a in Turkey that mm -hmm. um, broadcasts Brotherhood messages. And it, the other week, it broadcast a message by a prominent extremist Palestinian preacher who um, is has been listed and may still be the Secretary General of the International Union of Muslim Scholars' uh, Palestine Committee. Mm -hmm. um, so he gave this interview the other week and he said he drew on accurate, important Islamic scripture and presented it in a way that was, um, I think there's reason to argue and I think a lot of, of believing Muslims argue is inaccurate. Um, and deeply hateful and destructive. And basically he was arguing that because of a, um, of a teaching about the end of days, judgment day, when some, um, some Jews will fight against some Muslims and some Jews will be killed. Um, he took that um, teaching and applied it to argue that the way to protect the people of the world and the people of the Middle East and, and the Arab world um, is to slaughter all Jews today. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, having been a Jewish person who travels to Qatar, I don't think that that's Qatari policy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd love to see Qatar condemn him, right? And to ensure that none of its funds reach organizations that he participates in. Um, with regard to the textbooks, uh, mm -hmm. take a, you know, a long way around to get to, to that part. Yeah, of it. because, uh, yes, I mean, this is exactly what is the direction. So what is their direction exactly internally, domestically towards their own people? How do they, what do they preach? Yeah, so it, it's very interesting because the, the textbooks are almost more like the traditional Saudi textbooks than the Qatari media messages per se. Mm -hmm. um, Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia are the two countries that are um, associated Wahhabis. with early a Wahhabi, mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better term, or you know, Saudi Salafi type tradition in the in the mold of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, um, 
And so those teachings really pervade the curriculum in a way that the sermons from preachers linked to the state um, are, are a little bit less sort of focused on. So it's, it's not necessarily like a, the, the textbooks I've seen from Qatar, at least as of a year ago, um, aren't like brother, Muslim Brotherhood 101. They're mm -hmm. much more like the Saudi curriculum over previous decades, which is extremely hateful and harmful, but not in the Hassan al-Banna angle per se, um, just in a way that perhaps aligns with it in important and problematic ways. So the, and I guess maybe whether it's brotherhood-ish or not is less of a question. The question is more, you know, is it spreading hate and violence and extremism and justifying hate and extremism by the brotherhood too? And you know, in that regard, the, the most hateful Qatari state textbooks um, that were identified, that I identified a year ago, that the Middle East Media Research Institute did mm -hmm. truly exhaustive and truly important work on documenting. Some of the Qatari textbooks are still available, but the worst ones, the most important ones, the ones at the highest high school levels on primarily religious studies, teaching extremist religious messages in some key regards about people of other faiths and so forth. Um, those textbooks were, were taken offline and no longer available for international monitors to assess. And in wow. fact, I talked to US officials about this at the time and I encouraged mm -hmm. them to ask their Qatari counterparts if they could see the books. And they never, at least the ones I spoke to never got to see them when they asked. Now, it's possible that those books are still being used exactly as they are and that the Qatari government's claims of having launched a reform process of the book since then is um, inaccurate in this regard. Um, or it's possible that those books are fixed, but frankly, I don't know. And I think it should be incumbent upon Doha and its international partners um, to urge that, you know, the burden of proof is on Qatar to prove otherwise, that it's no longer teaching such hate. Um, I'm not hopeful. It's really, I mean, almost unbelievable that they would be able to hide it, right? Mm -hmm. to, to like hide it from the world, what they're teaching. Yeah, um, it happens it, all the time though, right? I mean, like the, I experienced this with the Saudi curriculum for many, many years where in, I believe it was 2005, the Saudi, I think it was Adel al Jaber. I think he was still, maybe he was still a US ambassador to the US from Saudi Arabia then, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I think he and I think the king made comments to say it's it's being fixed or it is fixed. Um, except mm -hmm. fast forward over a dozen year la years later and I was still finding the same hate in there. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I was at a conversation with some Saudi, um, uh, former Saudi officials talking, but spokespeople basically saying um, in recent, it was maybe two, three years ago, um, about um, reform in Saudi Arabia, which in some ways I think is real. And in other ways I think is not there, not there yet perhaps. Um, and I, he was saying, you know, people need to travel to Saudi Arabia more. And I said, okay, absolutely. Um, what do I tell my friend who is gay, whether or not they should visit when the textbooks have been teaching that they should be executed? And he said, that's not true. That's not what they teach. And I said, you're wrong. I've looked at the textbook for this school year in Arabic on a Saudi government website and seen that. And he said, no, you must be misunderstanding. So, so often some people, you know, some officials or governments don't know or don't care or want to hide it. Uh, and um, for often the accessibility of the data is one of the biggest challenges. Um, so, for example, the Saudi curriculum is not, at least as of a couple weeks ago, is not accessible online anymore for anybody to examine. It was last year, uh, but now it's password protected. Um, mm -hmm. So when I check the books for this year, I need to look at them through third party sites for students, for example. Um, which is unfortunate because as of a couple of years ago, the Saudi government response about, are you dealing with this problem? Are you treating it seriously? was but one of the indications we're treating it seriously is we made all the books available online for you to see. Even a government that has made some notable changes in its books in the last year, like there's still areas where, where transparency is a real challenge on studying 
educational incitement throughout the region. This is one thing I, we could talk about a little bit also Please. later uh, towards the end, just because like, what is our role, right? Mm -hmm. These are countries that went to be allies with the United States. Yeah. Like, what yeah. type of pressure or um, basically just kind of demand yeah. we should be making because this is affecting everyone, not only the region, not only our allies, the people, but us here too. Oh. It's, it's a national security interest. But, you know, I kind of wanted to touch base on, on one thing you mentioned, which is conspiracy theories. And mm -hmm. this is something that is so prevalent in the Middle East and the Arab countries. And it's been very harmful. And when we talk about Qatar, you know, you, you, we know that there's AJ plus now in English and the same conspiracy theories type of ideology that's being spread here in English. And it is very dangerous. Um, you know, we believe in free press, we have free press, but it's being used mm -hmm. to do the exact same thing that's been done for decades, which caused nothing but war and hate and anti-Semitism, uh, all of the above. So can you share with us a little bit more about this aspect? Sure. I mean, the, the really striking thing about con the conspiracy theories in this regard is that they often, they are they do have a very significant political um, impact and, and legacy in the Middle East. And there's something that, that transcends regions and societies and what have you. So you know, a couple, maybe two, three years ago, there was a city council member here in Washington, DC, who said something about, um, I think he was talking about climate change, but he, he basically claimed that um, the Jewish Rothschild family um, is manipulating, like has a weather control machine to harm and exploit humanity. And like, it's so outrageous, it's hilarious. And like, this was a civic, this was a civic leader, right? And yes. there thankfully was a, a lot of follow on uh, consequences and discussion and engagement and pressure over that. Um, and, I mean, with, with these sorts of things, like you find that, I find the, that same conspiracy theory in Mideast media sometimes. Um, I find that the, I mean, if you go back to the, the end of the 1900s and beginning of the 2000s, uh, sorry, the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, um, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a, mm -hmm. is a fundamental um, landmark work of anti-Semitic disinformation. Um, it was created by a, it was written by an agent of the Russian intelligence service mm -hmm. in order to basically um, create a scapegoat for hardships that Russia was undergoing at the time um, to say, it's not our fault that, that our people are having a hard life. It's the fault of the international Jewish conspiracy that must exist. And here are all the different things that it must do through secret societies, through capitalism, through communism, through drinking blood, through greed, through total power, through um, murdering prophets. Um, and so it-, it It's basically it, trying to displace the blame on themselves for the failures and their own misdoings. Right. on the, the minority defenseless group. Right. It's and so been a historical tactic. Exactly. And, it, and in the Middle East, these have been, many of these same narratives have gained um, traction because of widespread legitimate concern over the well-being of the Palestinian people, right? And their, and their legitimate aspirations. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, a lot of these same myths have been adopted in, in Middle Eastern media and in Middle Eastern politics. Um, and in fact, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion itself is an extremely common book to find at state-run book fairs throughout the Middle East, even in states that are not um, as engaged on incitement or opposed to Jews, um, mainly because it's exhibitors from other countries bring it into the state-run book fair and the governments in these places don't know which books to look for to keep out that are at odds with their own stated objectives. Um, so the, um, these sorts of conspiracy theories are really common. And part of the challenge is helping allies, uh, people of good conscience in all of these societies to know what, which of these claims are myths. 
and how to find them and track them down and how to do so in a way that is effective and responsible and not in a way that that is or comes off as some sort of conspiracy against the Palestinians or against Islam um, and, and to address this issue in a way that also doesn't encourage Islamophobia or, or xenophobic. Mm -hmm. So for, I mean, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooter mm -hmm. believed a similar version of this conspiracy theory, but he also believed it in a way that was fundamentally anti-Muslim. Um, mm -hmm. His belief was that white people were being uh, the victims of genocide in America by um, America being overrun with savage uh, people of color, immigrants, and violent Muslims was his mm -hmm. thing. And that um, the puppet masters behind this anti-white conspiracy was the Jews. Uh, and that this synagogue that had hosted a pro-refugee um, Shabbat Sabbath service um, was part of the anti-white genocide. Mm -hmm. So it was the same sort of puppet master, anti-humanity, greed kind of conspiracy theory that he had, but he, but he used it in a way that was hateful towards Muslims and Jews and, yes. and Americans. And so one of, one of the challenges that I've confronted, that I've encountered um, when working on this portfolio is that people who want to spread these sorts of hateful myths on different sides of the issue will exploit it too. So, you know, I, my work, my, uh, some of the quotes I gave to the Washington Post on changes in the Saudi curriculum this year. Mm -hmm. um, they've been republished in really good ways yes. and really important ways. And a small minority of the coverage I've seen just last week, I was looking, the Iranian press, in Persian, the Iranian state press is promoting it to say, look at, look at the House of Saud, they're traitors to Islam and Islamic causes because they're moderating their textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, and Islamophobes here in the United States or in Europe will often try and promote these sorts of research findings to argue that Muslim states and Muslim societies are inherently um, hateful. Mm -hmm. And then those Islamophobes use that argument to try and advance hateful actions or policies um, that harm people who are Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thankfully it's not the bulk of, of response that I get when I do this kind of work. Um, but I, I'm, I always try and be as careful as possible to address and dispel those sorts of conclusions um, and to try and discourage that sort of conclusion on both sides because the last thing I want is for you know, our efforts to that are aimed at encouraging tolerance and tolerance education to be, to, become an, to be used as an excuse to justify more hate. Yeah, and that conspiracy theories are doing nothing but promoting hate. Yeah. And it's really interesting that both sides, the extremists, are actually blaming the Jewish people on both sides, completely for the opposite reasons. Yeah. But and it's just- the Islamophobia or anti-Arab bigotry too. Yes. And then you have the opposite side, which is trying to, you know, say that because they support the Palestinians, for example, that they have to somehow blame Israel rather than try to understand the whole context of what's really going on in the region. So it's a really complex story. It's really dangerous. And then, as you said, mm -hmm. you guys are doing a great job highlighting this problem. Um, and that is very important to kind of be brought out to the light. Thank you so much. I, I just wanted to, to ask you, based on, on your experience um, working in Mideast media, mm -hmm. um, have, in what ways have you ever encountered hate? Not necessarily, you know, be it directed at you or just that you've seen people expressing or misunderstanding that, um, you know, be it anti-Jewish hate or anti- um, Christian or anti-Muslim or anti-Arab or anti-Kurd or anti-Israeli. Um, in what ways have you, have you seen some of this kind of thing manifest in the field? And um, how do people respond to it? In this specific part of the world where I grew up, um, it's very prevalent. Um, each minority group is being kind of highlighted or, or painted 
in a way that is very demonizing, dehumanizing, and it's not true. And based on that, what happens is that there's all these also, again, conspiracy theories about minority groups. Uh, you know, I have yeah. had people tell me about the Druze, for example, mm-hmm. that they have uh, their own specific customs at home that are very outrageous, which is completely not true. But yeah. people believe it because this is a minority group that is easily kind of bullied because they're defenseless minority group. So, I mean, we see that throughout the history in the Middle East, unfortunately. With, with both Druze and especially with, with Shiite, regarding Shiite Muslims, one of the common hateful, um, hateful lies, slanders told about them that I've, I've seen people try and articulate and, and have done my best whenever possible to tell them, no, that's wrong is this uh, misunderstanding of, of the concept of taqiyya, right? Mm-hmm. This idea that um, under very, very limited, narrow, historical, particular theological circumstances, it's okay to, um, to not say the whole truth, all the truth, if like it'll get you executed in a pr- very, very narrow theological circumstance. It has been exploited by anti-Muslim bigots or anti-Shiite bigots to argue that um, Muslims or particularly Shia um, do not believe in telling the truth, which is just so, so not just obvious, but inhuman to argue. And it's exactly so, so harmful. But like you see these same, you see different lies about different groups, different types of hatred, but it's all the same fear, it's all the same enmity, it's all the same misinformation. And it's, it's such a challenge, especially to be able to bridge national barriers and cultural and linguistic barriers to get the right information to people so they know that, that these lies aren't true. Absolutely. And education is a major part of this. Media is another major part of this. Also, the understanding that people have the right to believe what they want to believe freedom of religion freedom of belief is really important and it is something that's a whole other topic of conversation in a whole other day right and it exactly that yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) and in the middle east and everywhere in different ways right absolutely but you know david definitely when we're talking today we cannot not be optimistic about the future of the region, especially that we see the Abrahamic Accords. And then there's definitely the world before and the world after, even though we're still seeing the world after, uh, yeah. maybe unfold as we speak. Yeah. But this is gives a major promise to the people of the Middle East and for the rest of the world of a dawn that is mm-hmm. starting to happen in this part of the world. Um, in your opinion, if we talk about the before and after yeah. of the Abrahamic Accords. Can you share your insights on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, given that like, you know, coronavirus is still determining so much of all of our daily lives, right? Like in some ways, there's so many through lines between like life before and life after, right? And, and that's also the case with like Mideast geopolitics. Like there's a lot that stays the same, but there are really some things that are remarkably wonderfully different too, right? I mean, the... Um, from the perspective of someone who works on anti-Semitism issues, the sort of um, sea change that I'm seeing in terms of it becoming okay to talk about Jewish people in new ways in parts of the region and about Muslim Jewish understanding and about um, Israelis. Um, and I think you also see it on the other side too. I mean, there was there was a really striking Hebrew University poll the other week about some of the real challenges of, of anti-Arab bigotry among Israeli youth. Um, and particularly more so among certain sectors of society than others. Um, but at the same token, you see thousands upon thousands of Israelis now flock, trying to flock to Dubai or looking forward to go to Dubai for vacation. and you know, Dubai is a very international city in a lot of ways, right? But the mm-hmm. that sort of, not just optimism, but like curiosity and fascination and, and um, exhilaration about going to an Arab capital um, is, I think, something that's going to have hopefully really, really positive long lasting effects um, 
in Israeli society. One of the common criticisms of the Abraham Accords is, is this argument that you see often uh, on the far left that it's, it's not a peace treaty or it's not a peace agreement, it's an arms agreement. Or it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not about building bridges, it's about um, reinforcing uh, rulers. Um, and I mean, look, leaders are going to make policies that they think are beneficial for their society and their you know, worldview and, and probably their ability to be reelected or hold, hold office and what have you, right? Like that's just the world. Um, but in terms of, of like, was this a treaty for F-35 jets? No way. Um, and, you know, will the UA probably get F-35 jets? Yeah, probably. Um, but to, to miss the, the like absolutely transformational consequential change of, of these Arab states taking a really bold leap across some really, really daunting taboos and really getting a, a target painted on their backs by haters around the region, right? Mm -hmm. uh, call them a new Sadat and want to see what happened to Sadat happen to them, right? Like making peace is not easy. And just because the UAE and Israel never fought a war against each other doesn't, doesn't diminish its significance in other ways, right? Like Sudan and Israel just a couple of years ago were really and truly enemies in a lot of ways between the states and um, between those two states. And, uh, and like, I, I want to see the consolidation of democracy and human rights and pluralism and humanitarian flourishing in Sudan really expand and, and it shouldn't be held, you know, hostage strictly to say the issue of relations with Israel. Um, so like that's, that stuff's really important on its own right. But like in terms of being able to see these sorts of hope for people to see their own well-being um, through a pathway of collaboration with the other is something that is so, so needed and so welcome everywhere, you know, including in the Middle East. And something that I really hope this process will be able to develop and expand in a way that, that really benefits the Palestinian people and their aspirations and their negotiations with the Israelis as well. Um, and, you know, if uh, 2022 can surprise us in some other ways, that would be a really cool one if it happened. <laughs> and 2021, we, we still have time, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> We're yeah. still in the beginning of the year. I mean, as Americans and uh, the United States obviously has a major role to play here, um, it has presence in the Middle East. Yeah. And when we look at um, an ally country like Israel, we know that minorities are protected in Israel. That the Druze I just mentioned, I was talking about, you know, they have all of the rights uh, that they don't probably enjoy in other countries in the region. The same thing for so many other minorities, including Muslims, Christians, Baha'is. Yeah. But what should we be demanding from other allied countries or countries who want to have good relationship with the United States mm -hmm. to also grant these equal rights mm -hmm. to every citizen of these countries and that we do not allow bigotry and hate and anti-Semitism, all of these, you know, rights that people should enjoy. And obviously the, the ability to believe what people want to believe and practice their religion and freedom. I think a lot of it varies country by country, right? Um, and case by case and issue by issue, but governments being urged not to print hate in their government textbooks for educating the next generation seems like a, a pretty basic, reasonable demand to make, right? And sometimes if, if officials may not know sort of, or may not be sure sort of which things are most do sort of outside actors or communities or allies see as most meaningful in that regard, you know, by all means, we should all sit down together and say, and like come up with some better solutions, right? Come up with some better ways to frame something that's still true to, you know, societal values and, and um, interests, right? Um, when it comes to um, freedom of, of religion, right? Um, the, like, 
I don't expect that I will be able as a Jewish person to travel to, um, to the holy city of Mecca with, you know, in my lifetime. Um, but, you know, it would be nice. You don't uh, expect that? Right. But, you know, there is now a Jewish, an association of Jewish communities in the Gulf for the six GCC states that was just launched a week or two ago. So like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if a synagogue could get, um, you know, publicly licensed and welcomed by the rulers in all of those countries, I think that would be, that would be a really nice thing. Um, the government of Egypt had a, for many years, unfortunately, a very hateful state television show that was framed as a talk show about all, all current affairs issues related to Israel. Um, it was called The Blue Line. But even the name of the show was an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. It was the, based on the idea that um, Jews aspire to conquer all land between the Nile River and the Euphrates River and, and are you know, deviously tricking people until they can get that. Um, and it, it seems like the show has finally been taken off the air after prolonged protest by outside extremism monitors. Um, mm -hmm. last I checked. So, you know, things like that, right? Like it need, it's not just about the textbooks um, and it, it's not just about inter-religious tolerance too, right? Like some of it is a matter of, of tolerance for different political points of view, right? And it's uh, tolerance for free speech within the realm of not inciting you know, hate, violence per se. So like, you know, America has the first amendment and sort of different principles about freedom of speech than, than a lot of the rest of the world. Um, but, you know, one, one thing that, that the US government generally, um, US officials generally believe in, and I agree with is that societies generally are more stable and um, successful when there's room for really rigorous and sometimes painful, harsh debate about politics and policy um, without retaliation, provided it's you know, done so in a way that's not um, direct, you know, that's not calling for violence. So you know, that's one area where like in the Middle East, there's a lot, there are some really great steps towards um, freedom of religion in some places. Um, and, free discourse about policy is sometimes more challenging and, and an area where hopefully, you know, we can see some more progress in ways that really benefit everyone. Absolutely. While we conclude this, uh, yeah. our episode today, and I really love talking to you, David, um, on a hopeful note, what do you think must be done? Like if we are talking about steps right now mm -hmm. to make the region a more tolerant, open, loving place where yeah. hopefully there's a, a true and lasting peace. Yeah. What must be done today? It's a, it needs to be a whole of societies and whole of governments effort. So it's, it's, you know, building bridges across boundaries and meeting the other and hearing their concerns and, and collaborating to address that. It's striving to be the most, um, inclusive and um, uh, pluralistic society and equal societies as, as we can build and, and respecting the other and their differences and different traditions, right? And it's, and so, but at the same time, right? Like it can't just all be playing, you know, love songs around a campfire and sing, you know, kumbaya and toasting marshmallows, right? Like <laughs> there's extremism and violence and militancy in the world that that is dangerous and threatening. And so it also needs to involve collaboration and, and security cooperation against those sorts of threats while you know, doing our best to allow diplomacy to you know, not resolve every conflict with, with the bullet, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's every day there's new challenges in, in every neighborhood and every region. And, and I, you know, maybe I'm dipping into platitudes a bit too much here, but you know, there's there's a lot that everybody can do in our own communities as well as as in international policy and and educating tolerance i think is is one of the universally applicable dimensions of this that i i think we all can be doing a lot more together in the years ahead 
Thank you so much, David Weinberg. I would love to have you on again soon to talk some more about this. Thank you all for listening and watching with you, Havy and the Untold, and I'll see you next time.